it came time to put something on there, usually I was never at a loss of an idea. And I would just go with uh, whatever popped into my head. But if there was something particularly funny going on in the episode, then I would try to weave something from the episode into into what was going on the board. Yeah. But I would have to say that maybe only one third of the time there was a, a meaning from the, the storyline. Otherwise, it was just something that was funny. Maybe something that we were talking about at work that day, or, or maybe it was something that happened earlier in the week that we were all laughing about. So it could have been random. It could have been anything. But there are times when it's obvious and you can tell what it is. And there's other times when people would scratch their head and go, what is that supposed to be? <laughs> Llega fin de mes Pampa y la vía sin tener un plan Menos hojas en el calendario El tiempo no vuelve más Vos fuma que todo, todo este gris Vos fuma que todo, como siempre y hasta el fin Vos fuma que todo, y banco a morir más allá de que para algunos la serie tuvo cierto declive hacia el final de las temporadas, nos regaló un millón de grandes momentos, un millón de escenas inolvidables, desde un armadillo judío hasta Bamboozle, por ejemplo, el mejor juego de la historia, el más absurdo también, ¿por qué no? Por eso lo interesante es ver cómo se construyó cada uno de esos momentos. It's not uncommon in a city, and we thought that might be a nice way to put the door. There's lots of there's lots of challenges in trying to squeeze our sets all onto the stage. So that also helped us to not have the door open on the side. So up in the back we had more room. And also in the pilot, it was very specific in the pilot that Rachel had to make this amazing entrance wearing the wedding dress. And It seemed like a really good idea. It's a very strong place in the theater to put an entrance upstage so that when that person comes through, they're walking right towards the audience, or in this case, right towards the camera. So that gave her a very powerful entrance, and everybody had to, like, turn and look. Yeah. So it really threw the focus to this moment, which really was sort of the beginning of the story. It was a simple story and it was a love story and it was, you know, between Ross and Rachel. You write character arcs. So the first season was going to be building towards Ross and Rachel kiss, basically. And yeah. then um, you need, you always needed an obstacle. We always knew that Ross would get a uh, another girlfriend and, and we wanted to turn the tables and have Rachel finally um, acknowledge, you know, Ross And, you know, that was set up in the pilot. The DNA was already there, that she would finally turn the tables and he would be with someone else. The whole thing is finding an obstacle. What keeps the yeah. boy and girl from getting together? Because once they kiss, it's a totally different thing. Yeah. And obviously Friends was able to do that amazingly well. And then you start cannibalizing the other relationships in the show. One thing that production designers like to do when, when we design a set for a new series is try to give things that, We haven't quite figured out what they are yet, but maybe the future, the story writers can, can come up with answers to us. So I put a little door upstage in the hallway, which later on became, I said, I don't know, maybe this is a closet. Maybe it goes to a spare room on this pilot. We don't know. Why don't we just put a door there and we'll figure it out? Yeah. So then they wrote a whole episode of that it was Monica's secret closet. Do a big reverse, you know, we had to go through, shoot through the closet back out we had to put all the walls back in where you normally would have seen the audience but we had to put walls back in so i think that's one of the only times we ever had a big reverse like that i wasn't trying to open your closet i wasn't trying to open your closet i swear wow monica runs a pretty tight ship around here doesn't she we put out a little little uh, uh, area outside the window which in new york we used to call tar beach Because in the summertime, if you wanted to go outside and you didn't have a proper balcony, you'd oftentimes climb out the window and go on 
a section of the roof which might have been set back from the rest of the building. So even though many of those were, you know, official uh, uh, balconies, in this case it was just a little outperch of the building and so that became a place for the characters to go. Con tantas escenas lo interesante es ver qué problemas tuvieron al momento de hacerla, qué consecuencias tuvieron, por ejemplo, para los distintos sets, estas distintas escenas que podemos ir nombrando. Le pregunté a cada uno de estos personajes involucrados en Friends durante tanto tiempo que eligieron las 10 escenas más complicadas de la serie. Boy, they were all hard. I mean, you know, the, the, the Barbados one was particularly hard because it had to rain. And the, that really creates a lot of problems in terms of The backdrops that we get can't get wet. You, you have to use this special pad. You have to build a tank all the way around the set so the water has some place to go that then can be pumped out. Yeah. So that added a lot. And then you have the sound of the rain, which the writers always write rain and then they hear the rain and then no one wants to hear the rain. So you can't make rain quiet. Yeah. So that, that had its own unique challenges. It was fun to design that tropical inspired hotel. Oh my god, it was a night for me it was a nightmare. You know, we had to have rain on everything and and we had to have I think we had to have night, day, storm, you know, overcast, storm, rain, you know, it was it was a big project. She's clearly in love with Mike. You know, it's very hard to take you seriously when you look like that. <laughs> the wedding episode at that point was the highest rated episode in television to that point. I don't know, I'm sure there have been higher um, television uh, episodes since then, but at that point it was, and it was great because then we went on this whole press junket and it caused a lot of discussion and, and it was good because it really allowed people to listen to the conversation about you're uncomfortable with us, why are you uncomfortable with us? It's, it's your religious belief, well let's go to that. You know, nothing makes God happier than when two people, any two people, come together in love. Friends, family, we're gathered here today to join Carol and Susan in holy matrimony. For me, it's always been about love. And so it wasn't a big deal for me. But it was a big deal for those around me, for sure. I know that my, my own father, very conservative Christian, made sure, right before Friends started, he made sure that his friends were at his house and he had Bible study every Thursday night. So they could never see what his daughter was playing, and then um, eventually, and he, you know, we didn't really want to talk about it. He didn't preach to me, but he didn't want to talk about it. He just hid it. And then I remember going to his house once, and he said, "My friends have been sending me newspaper articles about what you've been playing, what you've been doing," and he said, um, "I'm proud of you." Because he could see that it was making an impact, which was huge. But this was years later. This was probably six years into it. He was finally understanding that um, what what this really means, and it really means about love. See ya. Federal law prohibits any joking regarding aircraft hijacking or bombing. You don't have to worry about me, ma'am. I take my bombs very seriously. Sir, you want to come with us? No, wait! I do remember, though, that we didn't have an audience for quite some time. And the girls were pretty freaked out, and they would have those bomb-sniffing dogs come through and, and go through the whole stage. Because 
because it was a pretty scary time. But I don't think we had an audience for a month, at least maybe four shows. Whoa, that, and how did you like su supply that? H how was because this was like a, a live a live show, and you I need... guess the crew just laughed when you know most of the crew took over like we were the audience. You know, I would say I would say at least four shows there was no audience. Well, that's... they wouldn't they wouldn't let them in, and it was almost impossible to get on the lot to get on Warner Brothers. You know, they were checking under the cars and. You know, it was it was a pretty scary time, yeah. and the girls were pretty freaked out. After he passed out, we put the sand around him to keep him warm. <laughs> one set in particular that was like a real uh, unbelievable one was they were staying at a beach house and it got filled up with sand. Yeah. We had sand on that stage for years to get rid of that <laughs> sand. It was yeah. just a mess. When I got there on the fifth show. The first thing they did when we got down to the set, right after that party thing was over, nobody would talk to me, the AD came down and showed me my apartment. So to show me that I was going to be a regular, that, that I was in fact right in thinking, if I do five, I'm going to do more. Oh. Mr. Heckles. <laughs> I said, well, you know, who wrote this? Because I said, It's him I got it. He, the writer, killed me, not the producers. So I went over to the writer, and he was a nice guy. And he said, I said, you know, what? And I try to be calm, and I try to be nice. And I said, no, how, what were you thinking? What, why did you, why was I given a heart? So he said, well, I knew. And this is the first script I ever wrote. And it was assigned to me. And he said, you know, because I was like, Uh, 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 a sidekick on all the other scripts, you know, but this is my first, all right, you write this one yourself. I want to write about Mr. Heckles, and he's telling me this. I said, well, okay, so far, that's that's great, you know, and he said, and so I finished the script, and they came up to me, and they said, it's really great, except one of the coming episodes we have already written is... One of the guys moves out, but we want to keep him in the building. So we had already built the set. The point being that they said to the writer, we want Mr. Heckle's apartment. The set has already been built for Mr. Heckle's because he was going to be a recurring character, but we decided that one of the guys in, in a couple of episodes is going to move out, so why don't you give Mr. Heckles a heart attack, we establish the apartment, we move Heckles out, we move the guy in, and boom, and he's right across the hall, and everything is cool, and we, and we can continue on with our story. Goodbye, Mr. Heckles. We'll try to keep it down. The Caesar's Palace sets were so big, we had to take down the coffee house. And because we had, when we built the street outside the coffee house, it didn't sound good because we had the wooden floor and the wooden sidewalk. And it always sounded thump, thump, thump. Yeah. So after the first year, the third season, uh, the construction coordinator and I said, what are we going to do? And he said, let's do it the way they used to do it in the old days on movies. We'll make it real. So we made the sidewalks out of real cement and we made the street out of real asphalt pavement. And we put the pipes underneath it so that they could shoot steam out of it. Uh, and then it sounded absolutely real. So when we had to build the Caesar's Palace, we couldn't take all that away. So we had to build everything up on platforms so that we wouldn't have to do that, which made it a little trickier sometimes for the cameras. Where are you going with that disc? You are not putting that on again. Marcel, okay, if you press that button, you are in very, very big trouble. <laughs> Marcel wasn't always the most difficult actor to work with. Um, the funny thing about that was uh, the idea of the monkey was pitched by uh, my good friend Ira Ungerleiter. 
And uh, they said, when Frost gets a monkey, and David Crane said, no. <laughs> started pitching stories to the monkey and David's like we need to focus on our characters he's not getting a monkey <laughs> and then we just kept pitching on stories that had a monkey in them like what if the monkey did this and then I remember David goes okay let's let's it's not going to be a chimpanzee I'm not doing the ch- chimpanzee with the um you know with the toothbrushing and once David opened the door a little bit then it was all monkey stories <laughs> um, and I uh, I remember the monkey was on the cover of the Rolling Stone magazine with the friends, and I remember Schwimmer was not happy about that. And I remember hearing an interview where he said he hated working with the monkey, but it was very, very clear that the monkey was, you know, eating a lot of scenery. And uh, it wasn't that the monkey... It wasn't that the monkey wasn't... Um, you know, the friends were... You had a lot to service with those six characters, so I think uh, once the monkey started getting bigger laughs than uh, some of our characters did, it was time for the monkey to go. Two minutes to get dressed. But you know, I'd feel a whole lot better if you got dressed now. Okay. okay. <laughs> that particular episode was uh, not really the result of money. It wasn't a problem. The, the show always had, usually had enough money. But it was the result of the writers talking amongst themselves and saying, can we write an episode that just takes place in the apartment? It was a challenge that they gave themselves. Sometimes they whine about the money, but let's face it, in in the end, there was never a problem about money. I mean, sometimes they'd like, well, can we make it a little cheaper? But if the script wrote it and they wanted it, they got it. But, you know, that's an easy excuse. I always felt that it was the writers who said, let's see if we can do this. It'll save some money, which will be fun, and then everybody will say, aren't we great at the studio? Si algo queda claro es que abundaban las escenas y por eso no siempre las cosas salían como ellos querían. Pero así y todo hemos tenido 10 temporadas mágicas. Uh, oh, oh, um, no you didn't. I did. Oh, uh, uh, oh, oh, no, 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 uh, uh, uh. <laughs> Our last pizzas together as roommates. I wish I'd known you were going to do that. I already. I, 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 I have seen that. I have seen a couple of those. Those are great. What? In fact, I think in the eighth season or the ninth season, they gave the whole crew a, like a CD of the bloopers. I don't know, but you know, the Phoebe, she used to laugh like hell when, when people missed her line. She'd go hysterical. Paper towels here. Well, it's Marcus. <laughs> <laughs>